is a themed our once and future planet, which I'm going to wave up for those of you who haven't seen a copy, is uh, investigates this topic in, in detail and lifting and often hopeful account, including examples of success with ecological restoration. I've had the pleasure of meeting Paddy near Feathered, where I'm speaking to you from, Feathered in County Tipperary. Paddy did a, a very important investigative piece of work on the OPW flood plans on the River Clashawley in Feathered, which was hugely helpful to a cause uh, which is, is very important to local people here. So thank you for that, Paddy. I'd like to introduce you to our second guest, Porig Fogarty. Porig is uh, an ecologist and an environmental scientist. He's also a published author on the subject of tonight's discussion. And his book, Whittled Away, which again I'd like to, in the interests of equality, uh, wave at you. Um, Whittled Away, subtitled Ireland's Vanishing Nature, makes for fascinating reading. He, like Paddy, has argued passionately about the need for nature restoration as an urgent imperative and has noted how species extinction and biodiversity loss have attracted relatively little attention compared to the climate breakdown crisis, even though the two issues are known to be inextricably linked. Porig is a past chair of the Irish Wildlife Trust and currently campaign officer for that organization. We didn't invite tonight's guests with the idea of instigating an online or a virtual fist fight, nor even to encourage controversy, but I do note a difference of approach to tonight's topic between both of you. And we'll come to this divergence shortly when we get talking, but in brief, it seems to me, and I may be wrong here, that ecological restoration, which Paddy advocates, um, is about assisting the recovery of an ecosystem that has been damaged or degraded and returning it to health. Whereas the concept of rewilding, which Porig, I understand, espouses, is similar in concept, but favours the reintroduction of previously extinct species with replacement ones and carnivores such as wolves. So we would be fascinated to see whether those different approaches are reconcilable or not tonight. First, I'd like to ask you both just to get the conversation going about something that often troubles me, which is the how do you keep your spirits up when you're working in an area that is inherently fraught with sadness and with loss, given what we know and what you two particularly know about the challenges and the facts and the science of this area, and given that tonight's audience probably has many people who are also working in this field or who have a particular interest in it. Have you any tips or recommendations? How do you stay motivated and cheerful or do you? Can I start with, with you on that one, Paddy? Um, yeah, I think it's, it's something that everybody feels a great American environmentalist in the 1940s, Aldo Leopold said that to become conscious, and he said in the 1940s, to become conscious of these issues is to live alone in a world of wounds. And I, I think that is, you look at a landscape and you see the wounds that may not be obvious to many other people. In fact, many other people may see but think what they're seeing is really good and progressive and helpful. Um, so there is a problem there, but I think it's really, really acute today. I think the climate crisis uh, is advancing at the maximum rates predicted by scientists. And um, we're moving into areas where you can see one thing feeding into another. The pandemic is clearly closely linked to environmental degradation. There's loads of evidence for that. And so people are scared, people are, are frightened. Um, so I would say briefly two things. One is that I suppose I come from a, a political background also um, on the left, and I've always been very struck by something that the Italian Marxist Gramsci said, you know, when the shadow of fascism was falling all over the world, as we could see it's falling again today. Um, and he said, what our, what our period requires is pessimism of the intellect, because you've 
you've almost got to be pessimistic if you look at things honestly, but optimism of the will. So, uh, you know, you keep going. When you walk up, it is much less abstruse, is that if you love nature, and you immerse yourself in nature for your own personal well-being and, and that, of those, that of the people around you, um, that it is, I still find to this day, the regenerative, regenerative power of a walk in the woods, a walk on the beach, um, is enormous. And you don't, you know, you don't have to be a bird watcher or a botanist to, to feel that. I think many, many people, I think there's a much more constituents feel that. So those are, those are the two things um, that we have got to maintain while looking unblinkingly at the challenges we face. Porig wrote about this very well recently and might like to elaborate on it, I don't know. A series of challenges we face, but at the same time, we do have to keep our spirits up and nature itself is the best way of doing that. And I'll probably come back, thanks Paddy, we'll probably, we must at some stage address the interaction between COVID and these issues and you've touched on this and many would theorize that the opportunities that have arisen for people to re-engage with nature from COVID have been some of the very few positives but that's probably to develop in our discussion a little later. Porig, can I ask you how you st stay motivated and keep your spirits up in, in the face of science and facts? Yeah, I, I talked recently about um, how a lot of people ask me if I'm optimistic uh, about the current situation. And of course I'm not, I'm, I'm not at all optimistic. Um, but I think people can confuse that sometimes with fatalism uh, because I'm not at all pessimistic either. You know, I feel that at the moment we uh, we're, it's all to play for. And uh, I, I find kind of uh, optimism and pessimism are not particularly useful uh, tools uh, to deal with this crisis. What we need is action. And I think we can remind ourselves that we're not, we're not spectators in what's happening. We are participants for good or ill. And that's important. I think we can be part of the solution. We can all be part of the solution, uh, no matter what your level of agency is. And um, I think one of the, uh, the most striking things that I heard recently was, you know, a lot of people ask, what can I do as an individual? And the answer is you can stop thinking like an individual. You can think like you're part of a community. You can think like you're a citizen of a nation or you can think like you're the citizen of the world. And you can, uh, you can take the action that, uh, that is suited to your abilities. And I would absolutely reflect what Paddy says. I think, you know, uh, nature is a tonic and uh, there's still immense wonder in nature. And I think that's actually part of our solution. If we can refine that wonder in nature, and even if you live in the city or the countryside or wherever, nature really is never that far away. Maybe it's in your garden, maybe it's a spider in your window still. And you can find wonder even in these small things. And, and that is, uh, and I think that, uh, that certainly keeps me motivated. Thanks, Borg. Well, look, with, with that introduction and that context, I'd like to, grasp the nettle, as it were, and come, come back to y your own particular involvements in this topic, and maybe come back to you, Paddy, and get you to tell us a little bit about your work with and your understanding of ecological restoration, and, and give us an overview of that topic, which you've gone into in some detail in, in your book. Um, Paddy, what is ecological restoration and why is it important? Well, it, it sounds like a bit of a mouthful, but it's actually hard to find another phrase that I think describes uh, so well what I think we're trying to do in conservation. Um, and I think most of us are, are trying to do more or less the same thing, um, in, in sometimes in different ways. And, um, but um, I had never heard of ecological restoration when I went to an American university in 2003. I was interested in birds always, I loved hiking, but I knew very, very little about ecology and ecological restoration, I had no idea. And there was a young English novelist on the same program that I was on. 
And we both were invited to a weekend of, of prairie restoration with the great American natural history writer and novelist, uh, Peter Matheson. And we were uh, um, blown away because we had grown up, and Gregory's much younger than I am, but we'd grown up with this dichotomy, this idea that there are two things that you do with nature. You either develop it for our use, which obviously we've got to do like every other species do, but that therefore in doing that, you degrade it, possibly ultimately destroy it, or you preserve it like something in, you know, a Victorian preserve jar, pickles, apricots, that kind of thing. And that's the national park model. You know, the old fashioned American national park model, you like you're quiet about this, of course, but what you do is you throw out people, usually people of another color, another culture, uh, and you build a fence and you say, what's inside the fence is nature, what's outside uh, is, 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 is culture. And never the twain shall meet. And that, you know, the only, the only way we engage with nature is either as a scientist or as a, as a tourist, in a sense. Um, and what restoration seemed to suggest was, God, yeah, a lot of damage has been done but there are people who are working to reverse that damage and you can in some cases remarkably quickly in most cases not you can actually restore a damaged ecosystem to integrity to full health and um we both found this idea really exciting and we we just had never heard of it and gregory was better informed than i am about the environment and it was Gregory who gave me the idea for my book. He said to me, he said, Paddy, you know, this, this is probably just a bit of American Midwestern nostalgia for a prairie they've wiped out. But what if it's happening all over the world? Wouldn't that make a really interesting subject for a book? And of course, I had no idea if it was or not. And very rapidly, I found out that from Vietnam to Mozambique, to my own country and to my shame and my ignorance, I didn't know that. There were extraordinary restoration projects underway. Some of them failing and you learn from failures, some of them succeeding. And um, so essentially, if I were to give an example, I think the, and it's fairly close to home, to you and Clonmel and, and, and to me and Wicklow, um, is uh, the, the restoration of uh, a bog adjacent to Abbey Leash, which has been a really remarkable, remarkable community initiative driven by the local community and how do you restore a bog when Borden and Mona have cut thousands of drains into the bog to dry it out? You know, hasn't that wrecked its hydrology? Hasn't it completely changed its composition? And that was in fact what the National Parks and Wildlife expert at the time in the early 2000s thought. He thought this bog can't be restored, let it go. And um, the community said no, and long story short, it's much more complicated than this, but they blocked drains, the bog re-wetted, and here's the miracle. It's not just that some of the plants came back or some of the animals came back. It's that the processes came back. So you actually have peat producing sphagnum regenerating on that moss at a larger and larger scale. So that's, you know, within two decades, a really remarkable piece of recovery of something that seemed irrecoverably lost. And I think that's what I find exciting about restoration. It's that it can engage people. We can all do it at one scale or another. You know, you can plant a native tree instead of an exotic in your garden if you have a garden or a plant on your windowsill if you have an apartment. Um, there are all those options. So I found, I originally thought of titling my book, Restoring the Future, because it's not about nostalgia for the past. Um, and, and the subtitle was to be a good news story from the environmental movement, because I think one of the communication problems that the environmental movement has had is that it has been so associated with catastrophe. And we've got to talk about catastrophe. We can't ignore them. But at the same time, you've really got to give people hope as well. And but but not in a bland Pollyanna type way. Uh, so I found that in spending the privilege of spending 10 years traveling the world when I could raise the funds, 
to look at restoration projects in different countries, different cultures, um, different ecosystems, obviously, uh, and see how many of them were working. Um, that gave me a lot of hope. And you've hinted that it doesn't always work and mistakes are, have been made and can be made. Do, do you want to address that or is, is well, that Well, briefly, sure. I mean, an ecosystem is, if you like, you, you know, the, an ecosystem is by definition more complex probably than our brains could ever possibly understand. There are so many things happening in an ecosystem from weather to subsoil, um, microbial life, which is critically important to the health of an ecosystem. So we, we kind of go in there and, and, and there are, it's very broad stroke stuff, a lot of it, you know, blocking drains. And, and, and so a really important concept in ecological restoration is it is management, but it is management standing back as far as possible. So that the ideal is spontaneous restoration. It would be wonderful if you could just walk away and let nature take its course. The problem is that we have altered nature so much. There are so many, for example, in place of lines. If you left the oak woods outside my window here, uh, as they are being left at the moment, sadly, um, if you left them uh, with rhododendron growing right through their understory, um, well, nature will take its course, but nature will be the rhododendron winning out. And instead of a diverse Irish oak forest, you'll have a rhododendron monoculture. Yep. So yeah, people have made, made some, some very bad mistakes, but I think part of restoration is, is what you, it's a, it's, a, it's a complex open air experiment and you must monitor it all the time. And, you know, hopefully every mistake teaches you, if not here, then somewhere else, not to repeat that. Thanks to come to you, Porig, to, uh, um, I, I suspect to support and to echo much of what Paddy has been saying, um, but without pushing you to be um, at variance with him, the, the word rewilding is one that does come up in your writing, and uh, some of us would have read Isabella Tree's book on the subject and have been fascinated by the concept of perhaps standing back more and uh, reintroducing species to an extent that perhaps Paddy would not agree with. But can I ask you, where are you in all this and how much do you go along with Paddy and where do you feel you diverge? Um, well, I think I first came to rewilding through uh, George Monbiot's book, which I think was 2013, called Feral. And um, what I found about uh, the way he spoke about rewilding was that it was just enormously optimistic and that uh, it was really about harnessing the inherent power of nature to heal itself and uh, scale, or it could be, do could be done at a very small scale. So um, I loved the, the kind of democracy of it, that you could rewild you know, a bit of your back garden or a community could rewild a part of their local park, or you could rewild an entire uh, mountain range or an entire expanse of sea. And, um, and so I thought, you know, that encapsulated um, a kind of philosophy as well, that it was about relinquishing control, about acknowledging that when it comes to ecosystems, we really don't know an awful lot about how nature works. And particularly in Ireland, because we don't have any intact ecosystems and we've lost so many species that, you know, really, you know, and, uh, being an ecologist in Ireland can be frustrating because we don't know what a, what an oak forest is like. We don't know what a, what an untrawled seabed is like, and there's so much that we don't know. And uh, within the uh, the concept of rewilding is accepting that, and accepting that when you allow rewilding, surprises will happen, and it will be unexpected, and there'll be twists and turns. Um, I find listening to Paddy that really there's an awful lot in common with restoration, and I. I I use the word restoration an awful lot because, you know, it is appropriate uh, half the time and sometimes, I, you know, so I find sometimes it's not useful to get too hung up on the words that we use. Um, I mean, things like, uh, you know, reintroducing species, you know, is, is accepted restoration practice. I mean, Absolutely. we've done it in Ireland. We've brought eagles back to, to Ireland over the last 20 years. So, you know, it's just we need to bring back the other 120 species that we've lost.
Um, uh, so I, I just find, and, and the other thing, of course, is that rewilding has been exciting, that it has engaged people. And I think that's really important. I think if, uh, if local then rewild or, you know, uh, a person with half an acre down the back of the farm feels they can rewild, that's great. They can participate. I think um, there's enormous hope in it. So, Porig, we, we, we must get these wolves out of the way and, um, and, and address this one because Monbiot and, and others have talked about the reintroduction of carnivores, including wolves, and this seems to have raised many hackles and we, we haven't even got into the interaction between agriculture and restoration and rewilding, which we must do. But c can you give us your, your take on introducing carnivores, which may not have been uh, part of our landscape for thousands of years? And, and why is that important? So there's, I think there's two uh, sides to that argument. Number one is what you might call the science side of it, is that, you know, the wolf has every right to be in Ireland as the golden eagles or the white-tailed eagles or the corn crake or the curlew. And so if we accept that reintroduction is a good idea, um, the wolf surely has to be on that list as much as any other species that we've driven to extinction. We know, of course, as well that uh, top predators are absolutely vital in uh, the health of ecosystems systems, sea or wolves in forests. And so um, just from, from a basic ecological scientific point of view, um, restoring top predators just is, is, is uh, common sense in my can you, point of view. But of course, sorry, can about, you just tell us why? Um, the same phenomenon has been seen, whether we're talking about wolves in a landscape or sharks on a coral reef, that the pressure of predators on the, uh, the, the, the medium-sized predators below them, they're called meso-predators. So in Ireland, there might be foxes or the, your pine martens or whatever. Um, that when the top predator was taken out, these smaller predators uh, boom, and they can predate on pretty much everything underneath them. So it has been shown in, in a coral reef that when you take the sharks out, the coral reef degrades and it gets covered in algae because that diversity collapses. And we've seen the same thing in Yellowstone Park in the USA, where the, where the wolves were taken out and the whole diversity and the integrity of the ecosystem uh, fell apart. So I think that is accepted uh, science these days. Of course, the other side of the wolf argument is that it triggers something in our imagination. And this is where I come back to that, that when I talked about rewilding and it's about control. People think wolves, oh my God, we can't have wild nature just running around the countryside doing what it wants we have to be in control and we have to be in charge of everything and i suppose that's why i like talking about wolves more than i like talking about let's say bittern but is also extinct and i'd love to see return because the bittern doesn't trigger that in people and i think that's an essential uh, uh, conversation that we have to be having now in the face of the biodiversity and climate crisis because we're not in control. Humans are not in charge of the biosphere. And in order to find a path forward for ourselves that is in some way in harmony uh, with the natural world around us, we have to accept that. And I think, you know, from a practical point of view, there's absolutely no reason why we couldn't accept wolves in Ireland. There are wolves in every other European country, uh, Spain and Belgium most recently. So, you know, the practicalities of it are, are pretty simple, but it's the psychological challenge that I feel is just as important. And, and at a technical level, do we have an big enough wild spaces to accommodate um, carnivores of, of that magnitude? Is Ireland big enough for wolves? Uh, well, actually, Ireland has no wild spaces whatsoever, um, but uh, we do have space for wolves. And as I said, we, we've seen in the last week, you know, a, a family of wolves in Belgium, which, you know, has no real wild spaces either. And it has a population twice that of Ireland. And um, so I definitely think um, uh, wolves, there's plenty of room for wolves in Ireland. And it also challenges, uh, I think, what Paddy was saying about the national park idea. The national park was set up to say, this is where we put nature. Nature will go into the national park and then we can go about our business uh, outside the na national park. But wolves would never stay in a national park. There's no national park in Ireland that could possibly be big enough for wolves. And in that way, it would bring wild nature back to all of our lives. And some people don't like that. Some people find that very exciting. Um, I find it very exciting, but I also think it is necessary 
uh, as part of uh, the, the change in mindset that is needed in dealing with the crisis that we face. So I suppose it's logically time to introduce the subject of agriculture and farmers. It'd be great to think that we have some people from the farming community listening in because it seems to me that there, there is a real tension, a real disconnect between people who think like you two and the farming community. And maybe it's a, a, a false um, problem. Perhaps there isn't a, as much resistance as, as uh, as we might fear, but I'd, I'd like to ask you both, maybe back to you, Paddy, about the tension. I mean, is, is there, can um, restoration, ecological restoration, um, is that consistent with a healthy agriculture sector? And, I think uh, it's probably, probably essential to a healthy agricultural sector in a sense, but I think um, I would just like to go back over, I mean, I accept a lot of the points that Pori's made, and I think rewilding in its origins, which are in the United States in very, very large spaces and people like the great conservation biologist Soule and David Foreman have written about it. And what happened in Yellowstone with the wolves is absolutely fascinating. But these were huge spaces. And, um, and I like their idea. I think their idea is core, core. So you need core areas. And, and America still has some core areas as Porix has there harder to find here, uh, corridors, so you link those areas, and, and carnivores, and carnivores are very important. Um, I just, with housing, I, I, I suppose, I, I understand the excitement that it has for some people, and I remember Porig, um, a few months ago, I think you organized a meeting on rewilding somewhere in the West, and you said, had we called it a meeting on ecological restoration, many, much fewer people would have come. That may or may not be true, depending on how well you publicize it and how you publicize it. Um, but I accept that ecological restoration isn't quite a sexier word. And Monbiot is very upfront about that. You know, he just, he likes the word. It literally excites him. Um, but I think wild and wilderness are very problematic concepts that we need to think about a lot. And I also think, but really, two things worry me about it. One is, if if you put all the focus on top predators, take the golden eagle, for example. We have attempted to reintroduce the golden eagle in Donegal. In many ways, a very, very well-run project. But the people who run it themselves, that Lorcan O'Toole would say that they have found there's a fundamental problem, that the habitat was not in a fit state for the golden eagles to breed, and they can breed, but they can't find enough prey to fledge their chicks successfully. So I think restoration is, it's a bit more boring, but it's kind of building from the bottom up, restore the ecosystem to a point that it can give the top predator what it needs before you do it. That's, that's one aspect of it. Um, the other thing is invasive plants, as I said earlier. I mean, and again, Pori, you've talked about in your book, you talk about Nefin. Uh, where Quilche have set up what they call a wilderness area. Um, but I mean, how wild is an area which is full of alien conifer plantations, which you, you might say, well, take them out, but if you took them all out quickly, and I mean, in less than 100 years, uh, you'd cause a great deal of erosion, sotation, problems like that. So, um, you know, I just think these are difficult, uh, problems and come bringing, bringing it back to agriculture. I think the problem in highlighting wolves as if wolves is what we're really talking about when we talk about biodiversity um, is that people, I, I would say if one person feels excited by rewilding and I suspect that that person will often be urban and a bit detached from the realities of making a living in the countryside. Another hundred people will be turned off by it and will organize against you. Whereas restoration, I think, is something that everybody understands. And in terms of agriculture, what has been wonderful to see in the Burren, for example, the Burren Program for Conservation, which is farmer-led and was originally conceived as a resistance to the EU Habitats Directive, but ended up because the farmers discovered they had a common interest with conservationists 
in controlling, and this was controlling, I'm sorry, but that is what we have been doing for species for a long time. And I don't think we, you know, if we're gonna stop doing it altogether, we're back to being hunter gatherers. Now, if you want to make that argument, you can. But I think that what's beautiful about the Burren is that they have gone back, they have restored an ag which is grazing, which controls the growth of hazel scrub. And that promotes floral biodiversity to a quite extraordinary level. You might even say an unnatural level. Um, but they've really been remarkably successful. And I think there are lots and lots of examples where I think of restoration is that you can encourage and incentivize, and people have to be paid for being stewards of nature for, as the barn farmers say, if I produce a cow, I want to be paid for the cow at market. If I produce biodiversity, I want to be paid for biodiversity. And I think that's absolutely, uh, somebody said, um, be careful if you go green. One farmer said, be careful if you go green, you'll end up in the red. You know, so you've, you, we've got to make it worth farmers while to restore, you know, even, even very intensive farms can do a great deal for biodiversity by relatively small acts of restoration. By, for example, leaving one meter of headland, the unplowed area between, between uh, the, the plowed area and the hedgerow. By leaving that fallow, they can do a huge amount for biodiversity and providing biodiversity corridors. And this is why I think I would stress that with restoration, the Society for Ecological Restoration internationally insists that the first principle of restoration is engaging with and gaining the support of your local community. That if you don't have that, you end up in a cul-de-sac. You end up in a very ugly war. Adi, thanks for that. You, you're kind of leading into, I think, where we want to go with this discussion later, which is the, the, the agricultural sector and getting people on board and changing the perception of the countryside. But before we do that, I'd like to come back to Porig about this, uh, I suppose, suggestion that, um, Paddy, you're more of an interventionist. Managing restoration is necessary rather than uh, locking up the neff and walking away. Is that a fair characterization, Porig, of, of your position uh, or not? That uh, it, it's a question of see what happens and it's an, it's an experiment and don't intervene, or is that wrong? Yeah, I mean, um, uh, invasive species are, of course, an enormous problem, and uh, no one would suggest uh, just walking away and, and letting invasive species take over. That is not, that's not a realistic uh, proposition. Um, so rewilding kind of sets up the circumstances so that nature, uh, nature, of nature where it maybe uh, can look after itself uh, into the future. So, uh, so you're kind of front-ending any intervention with the hope that eventually the, the ecosystem will be able to look after itself. So of course, in, in a peatland scenario, drains need to be blocked, invasive species need to be uh, removed. Um, a nice example might be um, in a, in a peatland, uh, in a raised peatland, where you have trees growing on the peatland that maybe you don't want. Maybe some people would say, you know, uh, uh, and I'm talking about maybe a native trees here, not necessarily invasive ones. Um, should we remove the trees because the tre trees are sucking and maybe affecting the hydrology? Or should we just let the native trees grow and uh, find their own balance within the uh, the, uh, the, the the landscape that that is present. I suppose rewilding would say we should probably just let them grow and let and see what happens. Um, maybe the trees will die in ten years' time. Who knows? It's a very long term thing. We have no idea uh, what's what's going to happen. But certainly. Um, Rewilding is not about zero intervention. It's not about, uh, uh, you know, just building a fence and walking away from things. And it's, I mean, I, I feel it's very much um, uh, uh, open to human participation and human uh, engagement with us. Um, it's not about, uh, you know, I, I don't, you know, we're, we've never suggested that agriculture should, should cease so that the whole land, our island should be rewilded. Agriculture, of course, is necessary. We need to, we need to feed ourselves. This is perhaps is the biggest challenge we face. How do we feed ourselves without, you know, tipping the, the, the earth system in, into, into a dangerous place? But we have to also recognize in Ireland that, you know, at the moment we farm everywhere. We farm on islands in the Atlantic. We farm at the tops of Carinthuil. You'll find 
sheep. Um, and really that's not, not only is it not necessary, but it's actually quite harmful too, because a lot of ecosystems, yeah, I'm thinking not suitable for farm animals. So yeah, there's, 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 um, there's a balance there to be found between the, the areas you might say that are predominantly for nature and the areas where we decide we farm. And of course for farming, where we, where we want farming to, to take place, that should be done in a, in a nature friendly way. And, you know, talking about the burn, you know, it shows that farming can be done in a nature friendly way. Of course, you might say there are people who say, well, you know, if you didn't farm in the burn, you would get um, Atlantic rainforests. You would get a rich diversity of mosses and lichens and, and other organisms, uh, maybe not colorful flowers. And, you know, it's quite a subjective thing to say that I want colorful flowers instead of, you know, a diversity of mosses. Who's to say one is better than the other? My personal point of view is that um, if you have a farming landscape and you have farmers who want to farm, they should be encouraged to do so in a nature friendly way. But where possible or it's not practical or there's no way of farming in a nature friendly way in a particular landscape, then we should be encouraging rewilding. Thanks, Pori. And, and maybe just before we get into the programme for government and financial incentives and all that, um, I mean, Paddy talked about buffer strips along hedges and touched on something that's very relevant to people living in Tipperary who worry about wholesale removal of hedgerows um, at a rate that is really quite troubling. Do, do you have thoughts on tidy farming versus something that is more nature friendly? And, and, and how, how one can change perhaps a perception of what is a, a good farm, because I think there's historically, and perhaps particularly recently been a sense that you're, you're a bad farmer if your hedges are too wide or too long, or if they're not cut to a meter in height every year. What, what would you say about that? Sorry, Alan, is that for me? Yeah, yeah. Oh, staying with you, um, because yeah. um, for strips. I, I think the, the, that mentality is certainly not confined to farmers. Um, you know, we all know gardeners who like to cut their grass every week and who buy, you know, half a ton of chemicals from the local DIY to put on the lawn because they want a certain aesthetic. They feel that their garden should look a, a certain way. I mean, the way to, to get away from that it really is education. And we've seen that in the All-Ireland Pollinator Plan, you know, plenty of local communities are familiar with the All-Ireland Pollinator Plan and the work that that has done in highlighting the fact that, you know, wildflowers that we have traditionally called weeds, like uh, thistles and ragwort and nettles and ivy are all just amazing uh, plants for invertebrates. And I think when you're armed with that information, you do change how you see things and you go no the ivy isn't a parasite it's not going to kill source for, for birds and, and insects in the winter so i really think that that kind of education uh, process is invaluable in changing our viewpoint on that what about the money i mean education certainly but the new program for government talks of a hedgerow survey and uh, ways of financially incentivizing um a more nature friendly form of farming do you think that'll work? Um, I do, yeah, because uh, we know it will work because it has already worked. We've met half, there's a dozen other projects underway in Ireland uh, that are doing just that and they're, they're paying farmers for particular outcomes. So I think that is the key thing. We have had these uh, environmental programs for farmers for many years where we've, we've paid them uh, to do certain things. Um, but they've really been little more than income supplement. And, you know, they've been, you know, we've, we've seen things like putting up bird boxes and bat boxes and stuff that really don't address uh, the, the, the critical problems we have with water pollution or, or species that are threatened. So the idea of actually paying the farmer to say, look, we want this particular result. We want more corn crakes, or we want more curlews, or we want more pollinators, or we want cleaner water. Uh, we're not gonna tell you how to do that, you're, it's your farm, you know the land better than anybody else. Uh, you come up with the options, you come up with the, and we'll support you with the science to do that. And if you produce the results, we'll pay you more. Ireland is a leader in Europe in designing those kind of programs. So we need a lot more of those and at way bigger scale than we have at the moment. So results-based payments are critically important as opposed to the, 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 the previous um, system. 
Absolutely. I mean, the, the farmers at the moment, I mean, it does, it does no favours to anybody. Farmers at the moment get paid for putting a pile of sand in their yard for bees. And even the farmers are scratching their heads going, how is a pile of sand going to help the bees? There's no science to support piles of sand uh, helping our threatened bee species. So it's kind of the farmers feeling doing something stupid. The taxpayer is getting any value for money out of it. Whereas the farmers in these results-based programs, they feel very proud of, of what they're doing. They feel they have more control over, over what they're doing. And they feel they're much more engaged and they're learning an awful lot. And the ecologists and the farmers are learning an awful lot from each other. So there's huge uh, benefits on, on many fronts. Yeah, I, Paddy, come in there. Yeah, I think, um, I think that's a very good point that you, 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 Bori, just where you were finishing up there, you were saying ecologists and farmers are learning a lot because I think one of the beauties of the Burren program and, and the way it's being extended across the country, I mean, we've Suez and Wicklow, which is uh, uh, hopefully going to develop into something similar. Um, what, is, what is really wonderful is um, that farmers, farmers own ecological knowledge. They mightn't always call it ecological knowledge, but their knowledge of their own land, their knowledge of their own soils, their knowledge about what works is being respected and drawn on. So that in the Burren program, they're not given a set range of activities that they have to do. As you say, it's results based. And if they can get the results, if they can get the certain limits obviously in terms of use of pesticides or whatever um uh, they their knowledge is being respected and i think that's hugely important that you know there is this terrible danger of of green movements being urban based and and and, and kind of telling farmers what to do farmers often know what to do but they've had very few choices they've been they've been driven by a very perverse incentives in the cap for many years and, and at the same time, many of them, the smaller farmers, have seen their livelihoods declining. So that, yeah, I think, uh, you know, a huge amount needs to be done there. Um, I don't know if you want to go back on the hedgerows and aesthetics and that issue there, or do you want to move on? Yeah. Or you to no, I, I do, Paddy. What's your take on that? Well, I think, yeah, it's, it's really interesting what... Um, there's a really fascinating story told about Yosemite, the, the very first... American model national park in the world. And you know, the, the Awani and Wawona Native American peoples were escorted off the premises by the US cavalry. And uh, 50 years later, they were brought back to the valley. The elders who were still alive were brought back to the valley. And you know, they were given a great party and, and the, uh, you know, the national park authorities expected to be praised for the wonderful work they had done. And the Native Americans looked at the valley and they said, you've let it get really dirty. You've got to let it get really untidy. And the National Park guys were utterly amazed because they said, no, 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 we've left it to nature. And the Native Americans said, we never left it to nature. We burned this valley every few years because Savannah was the kind of landscape in which they could best hunt. And so, you know, this Native Americans modified their landscape and had a particular aesthetic about it, which white people at that time didn't understand. And you can replicate that kind of story in all sorts of directions. So, you know, I might walk along a hedgerow in County Wicklow and I see a blaze of wild flowers and I walk down it the next day and new flower, you know, in spring, new flowers are out every week, if not every day it's incredible display but somebody else may come out with a strimmer and attack it and, and 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 reduce it to a uniform kind of billiard table of of, of, of and i guess we just have to talk about these things and um, you know we've all got learning curves to go through about them and certainly in restoration in a restoration project it's really important that you explain to people what you're doing and what it's going to look like, because there are certainly phases in a restoration project when the landscape may look much uglier in state, though it may, it may then develop onto something that is more generally aesthetically pleasing. Um, but tastes have changed enormously. And you mentioned um, Isabella Tree's book, 
Wilding, which is a fascinating book, really interesting, lots of great ideas in it. But I mean, Wilding it is not. Isabella Tree's ideal landscape is a medieval aristocratic landscape. And that comes through the book again and again and again. She doesn't like the Victorians with their tidiness. She likes the relative untidiness. And she even likes deer that hold themselves appropriately to an aristocratic atmosphere. So, you know, she has a, she has a particular, in, in restoration, we talk about reference systems. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's always this question, Porig raised it very well about the Burren. You know, which Burren do we want? Do we want the Burren prior to Neolithic settlement? Do we want the Neolithic Burren, 18th century Burren, et cetera, et cetera? Because mm -hmm. the other thing is that we mustn't forget is that human management changes over time. But yeah. ecosystems evolve and are dynamic. So there is no fixed ideal version of any ecosystem. And that is where I'm completely at one with Poor again, that we must also watch what is happening. And if the ecosystem without alien invasives, for example, is taking a direction that surprises us, well, we should probably let it go that way. Um, but um, there, so there are all those different dynamics. There's a human cultural dynamic, and the ecological dynamic. And what we need to do is, you know, it's we need to talk about these things. We need to talk about them without a sense of superiority that my aesthetic is better than your aesthetic. Yeah. We've got to try and find out why does somebody want to cut this? Yeah, thanks, Patty. I want to just make a, a plea for people to send in their questions using the Q&A to type in on, on the chat if they want to put some questions to you both. Um, but, but just staying with that uh, point you made, Paddy, about uh, putting people off and, and keeping people with you and, and uh, trying to sell uh, a better way of doing things. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we would feel locally again uh, on, on shoe of, of hedgerows, Ireland's rainforests, some people would say in terms of the huge biodiversity they support, that it doesn't have look on... on uh, unkempt and untidy. And we have a local farmer, Michael Hickey, who was one of the ambassadors on Farming for Nature uh, last year, who, whose farm is a wonderful example of a nature-friendly but productive beef farm, where he, he cuts the sides of the hedges but doesn't cut the tops. Um, therefore, the, the, the land is not encroached, but the biodiversity is preserved. So that I, I think, and I'd, I'd like to hear your thoughts again on this, about how you sell this. And maybe you've already said you've got to bring people with you in position from the top down. By definition, won't work. But I, you know, I'd like you to develop more as to how this is sold, how we can, you know, the people watching tonight may unfortunately be a selected, a self-selected audience. How do we bridge that chasm? Can, can I ask a very awkward question? Yeah. Uh, I think it's awkward for all of us. Is, you know, I think if we're talking about, and you mentioned the program to, for government, and, and, and so the need for change across the whole society, um, how do we ask people who have no particular interest in think they haven't? Um, and, one has to respect what people think about themselves. Um, how can we ask those people to support public investment or regulation on private landowners to achieve more biodiversity, et cetera, et cetera? And I do think there's an argument there, which is an actual capital argument, which is to try and explain to people that we are really in, this, in the same position as an individual or a state which has spent almost all its assets. We are reaching critical limits in every area of natural resources, biodiversity, and climate. So that we are spending far more than we invest in our environment. And unless we reverse that process, we are not going to survive I'm not going to say we're not going to survive as a species, but we're not going to survive as the kind of culture we are today. And in other words, that culture has to change in order for it, for some of it, to stay, to stay the same. So I do think there are very strong economic and survival arguments to be made, and that you can get people along on that basis. But I also go with the, you know, I, I talked about people not interested in nature or saying they're not interested in nature, um, 
I think that's possibly because of the way people like me maybe talk about nature sometimes, you know, and, uh, and the species we talk about and whatever. I mean, I've been at meetings of the Wicklow Uplands Council where, you know, somebody was talking about, about the wind. Most of us have seen very rarely, if at all, and they were talking about it with great passion, but as if everybody in the room was talking about and why it was important. And people were so alienated by that, you know? So I think one of the things that I love that Mark Boyden in Streamscapes does is he always says, you hold your first meeting outdoors, you bring people to the river and you invite people to talk about what the river means to them. And you start to hear their stories and you link into those stories and you respect people's experiences. And, and then you have to try and persuade. You know, if, if we're Democrats, that's what we've got to do. Then you try and persuade people to say, I love another example, Janice Fuller, an ecologist working in, in, in the West, who, who, when she's doing a biodiversity for a village, and she's invited into villages to do biodiversity plans, which I'd say poor would agree is not very normal. Um, and she goes into a village and she brings People, you know, she goes to where people are in the GAA, the church, the school, wherever. Um, and she says, I want a list of what you love in your landscape. Mm. Built landscape, and, you know, cultural landscape and natural landscape. And whatever you love, um, we'll put them in a list and we look at them. And then she'll say at the end of that part of the process, the first part of the process, she said, okay, now I know what you go guys love mm. the only thing as an ecologist i can tell you is that there are consequences that if you love x and you love y you may not be able to love z anymore maybe be destroying x and y it's that way of of going to where people are finding what their aspirations are and seeing to what extent we can share those aspirations and advance the things that we believe to be vitally Thanks, necessary. Thanks, Paddy. Porig, how do we change the match culture uh, way of looking at nature? Uh, uh, Paddy's given us his, his take on that. And uh, how, how, do, how do you do it in your everyday life? Because you're an, an advocate for exactly the same things that Paddy's been talking about. Well, I can tell you, if I had the secret uh, to that, I would have deployed it many years ago. I mean, that's really the million dollar question. I mean, our, our entire modern Western civilization have been, has been built on a narrative about the dominance over nature. So it's not an easy one to, to displace. I actually think that uh, many people, uh, like regular people, are, are way ahead of our policymakers on this issue. And I think that is borne out in... Uh, in surveys that while people probably don't know what a wind chat is, but they know that nature is important and they feel that nature should be protected. This is not a question about spending money and whether we should budget properly for it. I think people are generally behind that. Mm -hmm. The problem is that our entire society is in this vice grip uh, mm -hmm. of economic growth imperative. Mm -hmm. And farmers are as uh, sucked into this tornado like the rest of us and we're all struggling to think how on earth can we get out of this without everyone you know being flung left right and center and and, uh, and and all hurting ourselves it's a very difficult question to answer i mean ultimately you know we have to we have to wind down our economies to a certain extent we can we consume too much stuff and we have to wind down our economy that's a very difficult story to tell because it doesn't sound very appealing, does it, to say we have to consume less, whereas being told, you, you know, consume more and you can have whatever you want uh, if you just have enough money is very appealing. But in reality, this is the challenge for, for all of us, for educators, for policymakers, uh, for business leaders, um, because if we don't do it, the vice grip is going to tighten and tighten. And, uh, and as we already see, we don't even have to project very far, far in the future. Uh, communities are being torn apart by, by climate change and ecological grief. I mean, you don't, you don't have to look very far, right? There's, there's California, you can see the, the apocalyptic scenes from there. But look at our fishing community. Mm. Where is our fishing? There's no fish wor left worth fishing for, unless you have a giant boat and you can sail out the, the continental shelf uh, uh, with, with a net the size of Crow Park. Um, 
I mean, that is an ecological catastrophe for, for people uh, who have lived in those, those communities. Thanks, Borg. So really just, and, and this is the last question before, for me before um, taking one or two questions from the audience. And I suppose we've been touching on it as, as we talked, which is where does the new programme for government help us um, in, in trying to translate? Because you've talked about the economic model, the expansionist uh, development model that we, we're still stuck with. Are, are there the, the seeds of um, hope and change in the pro programme for government as you've read it? gentlemen and uh, obviously the the government is convulsed with covid and it seems very difficult to to see ahead of that but but we must look ahead and do you too feel that there, there is real substance in the program for government that can begin to translate some of this into action yeah um uh, I, I was a big supporter of the program for government i still am it's not it's not an easy thing to tie yourself to because uh, politics is very messy and, you know, un the unexpected happens. But um, if, the, if they do what they say they are going to do in the programme for government, I think it will be a game changer. Now, people should remember that we're not going to solve the climate and biodiversity crisis within the lifetime of one government or two governments. This is something that, you know, our children are going to be dealing with uh, in 30, 40 years time. But I definitely think uh, it can get us on the right track. If the government can lay the foundations for meeting our Paris Agreement targets by the end of the decade, that's enormously positive. They've talked about reforming the National Parks and Wildlife Service. That's enormously important. They've talked about uh, developing agriculture along with the things we've spoken about, like enhancing soil health and results-based schemes and all these things. There's provision for big marine protected areas and, uh, and restoring bogs. So there's a lot in it to, uh, to latch on to, you know, if you're, if you're looking for their optimism. But certainly there's plenty to be working on. Uh, and, and as I say, if they do everything in the next five years, we'll be in a much better place than we are today. Thanks, Paddy. Um, I'm, I'm very dubious about the programme for government. Um, I, had I been a member of the Green Party, I probably would have voted for it on balance and for participation in government on balance, but it would have been a very difficult decision. I don't have any great confidence that Sinn Féin has an environmental platform. They're very good on some issues like housing. Sinn Féin are, to me, pretty clearly going to be the next government and possibly quite soon. Um, maybe that's, those are the people we should be talking to. I don't see leadership coming from the Greens. For some reason, it just doesn't seem to be coming from them. Um, I, and I'm worried about some of the targets in the programme for government are so vague, like, you know, you know, Board Namona restoring 15, restoring 15,000 hectares of peatlands, but there's no, no explanation, no criteria for what kind of restoration this is going to be. And, um, and I, 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 I'm worried that Board Namona, having pioneered some very interesting peatland restoration uh, in the 2000s and, and up to quite recently, is now actually, I mean, I hear anecdotally comments like, uh, Asher, we can make do with restoration light, you know? And uh, I, I, I'm really worried that, that in, across the board, uh, there'll be a lot, it's like the UN decade of restoration, which we're just entering. It sounds wonderful. The Bond, Bond Declaration on restoring God knows how many million hectares of forest. They sound wonderful, but unless we really have a scientific approach and know what we're doing, know, you know, know, what, know what we're asking organizations to do, um, I, 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 would be, I would be pessimistic. And Porig, Porig mentioned uh, what is probably the elephant in the room, the National Parks and Wildlife Service. I would love to see uh, Noonan getting, getting his team for absolutely outrageous that in Killarney National Park, a very good volunteer-led rhododendron eradication program was abandoned, and that the Western Woodlands, which are our ecological jewels, under the custodian of the state and the state's environmental service, 
have deteriorated steadily and undeniably over the last few years. And the most frightening thing of all is that the scientists in the NPWS know and admit on the record that this is happening, but mm. they seem powerless to do anything about it. So a huge amount mm. of reform is, is needed there. Mm. And so, you know, I, I wish them well, um, but I think that uh, we need to see more leadership from the Greens and from those members of Fine Gael who are aware of these issues, because some of them are. Some of them, on the other hand, are total hypocrites. I mean, I, I think, you know, we really have got to get away from this paying lip service to recognizing a climate and biodiversity emergency and do, not only doing nothing about it, but continuing to move, as Porig says, in a directed by unsustainable growth and consumption. We have got to get away from that model. Thanks, Paddy. And, uh, and certainly at a local level, uh, your comments about the NPWS, the National Parks and Wildlife Service, would be echoed. Um, we have experience of excellent rangers and people Absolutely working. Absolutely, sorry. I don't want to, I yeah. don't want to denigrate every member. No, and I know your views because, because it, I think we would probably all in, in this discussion and outside of it agree that, that the problems with, the, with that service appear to be um, higher up and poor leadership and, and lousy resourcing. And, and these are things that are promised in the program for government to, to improve. But the, yeah, that's a real important specific. Uh, we, we would certainly agree with you. Um, we, we, uh, we got so excited that time has passed quite quickly and there are a couple of questions and there's a specific question for you both about what do you think of the proposed new forestry Bill, my very specific question, but uh, there are wider ramifications perhaps um, ab about it. So while we have you there, Paddy, do you have a view on the, the forestry bill uh, as it's proposed at the moment? Well, I think it's, uh, I think it's reactive. I think it's a response to a production crisis. Um, and uh, so uh, its focus is not where forestry policy should be going next. And I heard Pippa Hackett interviewed and I didn't think she was strong enough on that. But I mean, if it's a stopgap measure, health is very important to, to keep people in jobs. And, uh, uh, but I think we really have to be moving away from these um, industrial monocultural plantations and towards massive restoration of native woodland. And, 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 and then out of that, you can very strong hardwood industries that, that we lack at the moment. But that all takes, it takes investment, it takes time, it takes thought. But um, I, I think that, I think in a way I feel, I feel sorry for her. She's kind of been shoved into a gap which yeah. has to be filled. Yeah. Um, but again, it's not showing any vision or leadership in forestry policy. That's a, my view. Thanks, Paddy. Porig, some people would argue that the, um, the serial protesters were scapegoated, that in fact the, the issue was a reform needed in the forestry industry and, and that this, this has been um, misrepresented. What, what do you think? Yeah, the, the, the forestry in Ireland is such a mess at the moment and, uh, you know, the, the, the programme for government promised uh, a, a review of, of how we do forestry and, you know, this is something we really, really want. But instead of going for that review, they have started off with this, this uh, bill that is going to restrict the number of people who are going to be able to object. I mean, this is, this is clearly, you know, handed to them by the forestry industry and they're shouting in the politician's ear that if you don't do this, 12,000 people are going to be on the dole by Christmas and the politicians are reacting. Of course, it's a total false narrative. Uh, you know, the, the, the fact is the forestry industry hasn't been compliant with environmental law. And that's why the objections are being upheld uh, in very many instances. Uh, it was the Fine Gael government that, you know, they had one ecologist working in the entire forestry licensing sector. You know, it was, you know, and so there's this big pileup ha has happened. Uh, they have to work their way through that. But that's not going to be, be resolved by making it very expensive for people to object. It's only going to be resolved by, by doing it by the law so that people don't have to object. Yep. Corey, thank you for that. I'm just looking at another question that's come in that may put you to the pin of your colours. It's both of your top three actions that you would enact to increase biodiversity. 
that, that's perhaps a, a little bit uh, unfair to lob at you like this, but um, if you'd like, Porig, to maybe off the top of your head, maybe you've got already, or maybe three is just too few. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite all right. I spent a lot of time thinking about my, my top three. The number one would have to be the National Parks and Wildlife Service. Uh, what I really would love to see is a new nature conservation agency that is independent, a bit like the Environmental Protection Agency is at the moment, and that is well resourced so that it can really, you know, get on the ground, get, get in with local communities, create new nature reserves with local people and, and provide the science to help us do what needs to be done. So that'd be number one. My number two would be to create you know, really large, really effective marine protected areas to get rid of super trawlers, uh, to get rid of bottom trawling out of the ocean and to bring some life uh, back to the back to the, the ocean. Uh, and my number three would probably be to uh, restore biodiversity on our uplands. And at the risk of being controversial, I'd really like to see farm animals being taken off our hills and for uh, woodlands and for bogs uh, to to come back uh, to a healthy state uh, across our hilllands. Thanks, Pori. That's a great start. Um, Paddy? Well, agree on the NPWS being reform yeah. being incredibly important. Um, I would say also um, critically important is um, uh, environmental education. Um, I have much more investment in that in our schools, in our universities. Um, and I would also say that um, I'm very happy to see uh, that the Forum on Natural Capital is currently doing a natural capital assessment of four catchments across the country. And that is basically trying to tell people that, you know, if you look at a woodland, and a mainstream economist only sees timber. And that's the only value that has to be taken into account if you're going to extract timber from that forest. That we have to develop an economic system which tells people, no, no, there are other values here that you're gonna to have to pay for if you're going to exploit these resources. So that a forest also gives you pollination, it also gives you flood mitigation, it gives you general biodiversity benefits, it gives you physical and mental health benefits for the local community. And all those things have a value and some of them can be given a price. Um, I would like to see, as is supposed to be being, being done across the EU, natural capital accounts paid for, uh, sorry, natural capital accounts implemented right across the EU. And then we would see in black and white how much more of nature's goods and services we are spending than we are investing in. And we cannot, this imbalance is massive. It makes the banking crisis look like a little burst bubble. Um, and I really think we need to get the environment looked at at that level. We've got to have the environment considered as it's, you know, somebody said the, the economy uh, the environment is not a subset of the economy. The economy is a subset of the environment. And until we recognize that, and until right across the board, and maybe we should mention the Pope here, you know, in Laudato Si, there is actually really good in the encyclical on biodiversity and climate change, not convinced about the rather wishy-washy actions His Holiness is proposing, um, but at least there is one world leader, and there are others, of course, um, mm -hmm. but uh, one world leader, when many world leaders are going in the opposite direction, oddly enough, the leader of the Catholic Church endorsing good science on biodiversity and climate. And, uh, you know, if many of our cabinet are nominally Catholic um, or Protestant or any other form of faith, um, I wish they'd read Laudato Si and act on it, because I think yeah. Paddy, thank you. Um, just while we have you there, we've, there's obviously some um, heavy hitters in the audience this evening. I've just been passed a question for you 
are there any restoration projects currently that look at restoration ambition of Pleistocene uh, baseline with reintroduction of congeneric megafauna species? Are there any in the world? Um, uh, that seems to be the, the gist. Uh, I don't know whether it's well, world. I mean, there, or are, there are people in the United States who are arguing that they should bring elephants uh, into uh, parts of the West to kind of replicate the ecological function of mastodons. And um, yeah. honestly, I think this is a bit of a distraction at the moment, uh, but, but there is very interesting research behind it because one of the things we do need to think about is um, what were the mammals, the big mammals in particular, uh, that created the ecosystems we have today but that no longer exist. I mean, may they may be extinct because you have then the, the more extreme form of Pleistocene rewilding, which is actually taking, you know, I don't know, mammoth DNA and recreating mammoths or mastodons or I mean, some people even talk about dinosaurs. I mean, I think we've really got to, we've got to decide what reference system we want. Uh, I'm not aware, I'm open to correction on this and I probably will be corrected uh, of any Pleistocene rewilding projects, even, even in fantasy terms in Ireland. Are you, are you Porig? No, I've heard there's a project in Siberia, uh, isn't there? I'm not sure if that quite qualifies as Pleistocene rewilding, but he's trying to bring back, um, you know, the effects of mammoths. Ultimately, he wants to bring back woolly mammoths, but in the meantime, he's bringing back, uh, I don't know, large herbivores and so on. But I mean, I mean it's fascinating stuff. But it's a bit like talking about who would win a fight between Batman and Superman. You know, it's uh, you know it's great fun to talk about it, but I'm not sure it has much practical application. Certainly in Ireland, anyway. Staying with you, Pori, for a minute. Uh, Somebody has asked uh, in a separate question: Do you have any ideas on how we can reimagine our urban spaces to become more accommodative to natural processes? I, I'm delighted someone asked that question because I think it is quite possible to imagine our towns and cities as contributing, as in as, um, what I mean is by helping with the climate and biodiversity crisis. We've never looked at our cities as anything but kind of the opposite of nature. Like nature is in the countryside, it's not in the cities, but could our cities help to clean water? Could they take carbon out of the air? Could they provide habitat for species? I think the answer is absolutely yes, they could. And uh, when you look at cities and you think, you know, look at all those spaces that are used for roads and car parks, look at all the roofs that are there, look at how many of our cities are coastal cities by the sea, there's actually a lot of space there waiting to be rewilded uh, uh, in, our, in our cities. And if you could imagine, I've thought about this in Dublin in particular, you know, we've got the Phoenix Park, it's a very large area. Uh, it's very manicured at the moment. Imagine it was connected. Imagine we had a green bridge that went from the Phoenix Park to the Liffey and the canals. And we had these big like fingers of native woodland coming into our cities. Uh, and we had a marine protected area along the coast. I think it would be absolutely magnificent. Thanks, Could I just come in there for a second? Yeah. Um, I think the other thing with, with the urban, I'm really glad that question came up as well, with the urban space that is critically important is um, to actually appreciate what we have already. I mean, as I've slowly become a little bit aware of botany, which I wasn't aware of at all for many years, I've been amazed. I, I live most of the time in Stony Batter, which is an inner city area. And it's quite staggering how many wildflower species, how many ferns are actually growing on the walls in Stony Batter. And I think um, we're working on a project in greening Stony Batter at the moment to uh, try and communicate this more to, to residents. So I think it's like almost the first thing we need to do in the urban space is start having nature walks in the city. You don't even have to go into the Phoenix Park. Um, I completely agree with what Porig's saying about it, but um, you know, just on your own street, there's a lot more nature than you think. And I think that's a good place to start if you live in a city. Can I just come in on that just, just as an example? Um, the city of Singapore, uh, made a commitment, I think, 10, 15 years ago, that they were going to seriously green their city as a way of reducing pollution, uh, adapting to climate change, and just making quality of life uh, better. And they've done an absolutely phenomenal job in reopening water courses, 
planting like thousands and thousands of native trees. Uh, you know, uh, they've got families of otters and bringing wildlife back ever, creating nature reserves within cities. And it's been phenomenal that the, uh, the transformation. Which perhaps leads us back to the, the, where we started with COVID and, and how, how people have genuinely reconnected with nature or connected for the first time. And it leads me to a, a question I think I, I probably asked you in the past, Paddy, which is whether you need to, 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 to know what you're looking at to, to value it. By that I mean if you have no connection, you don't know the name of a plant or an animal or the, 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 the detail of the nature that is being lost, are you much less likely to wish to uh, preserve it or restore it? So I suppose what I'm asking is about the, the need for nature. And you've answered the question about nature walks and um, people re-engaging. But is that a, a general requirement that people need to know what is being lost to actually fight for it? Um, it helps. It helps, undoubtedly. Um, it, it, it's hard to fight for what you don't see. Um, but do you need to know the names of every species? Um, no, absolutely not. Do you need to know the names of any species? Maybe not at the beginning. Um, Pori mentioned the importance early on of a sense of wonder. Yeah. Um, that's actually the title of a short posthumous book by Rachel Carson, who wrote Silent Spring. And it's a wonderful book about how she goes out with her 18 month old or two year old nephew, often at night and just takes him on little walks. And she says, you know, uh, you know, she is an enormously knowledgeable marine biologist, but she says, you know, I never told him the name of anything. I just got him, you know, go out there, you know, get your hands a little dirty, look at that, fall into this, fall into the other. If you awaken that sense of wonder, then somebody will want to know some mm. of the names. So, so the first thing to do is to awaken the sense of wonder. Um, but everybody doesn't have to become a botanist or a biologist yeah. or, or an ornithologist. No, absolutely not. But I do think, I feel, I, I used to know about birds, but not about plants. Now I know a bit about plants and I have this really odd sensation that the world I live in is much more richly populated than I thought it was. Because I would walk along a hedgerow and all I was interested in was whatever was flying. Mm. And now suddenly I realize there's all this other life in there. And for some reason, diversity energizes, energizes us. It gives us strength. Thanks, Paddy. Just been passed another question for both of you. What do you think of American biologist E.O. Wilson's uh, belief that uh, half of the earth should be set aside for nature in order to preserve 85% of global species. I think you've probably um, addressed that to some extent, but do you, do you want to say more? Um, I'm, I'm familiar with, the, uh, with his book on it and I'm familiar with the idea. Uh, we do hear a lot about, you know, these kind of percentage targets, you know, at the moment we have a European Union biodiversity strategy that says that we want to protect 30% of, um, of our land and sea. I've, I've also seen 40%, I've seen 50%. Um, you know, I, I'm not convinced by these figures. Uh, I can see the theoretical background of it, and there is science to back up some of these figures. Uh, but at the end of the day, if you're saying we need to protect, let's say, half of Ireland for, for nature, then what's in the other half? Are we saying that the other half is not necessary for nature? Um, on the one hand, we're saying that people need to reconnect themselves with nature. But then what if you live in the half that doesn't have any nature or isn't for nature, you know, and that's probably our cities or our, you know, the, the high production farmland areas. So uh, I'd, I want to I'd, I want to live in an, in an Ireland where nature is everywhere, where you don't have to leave the country even or, you know, leave your town to have a rich experience with nature. Uh, That'll be different depending on the landscape. It'll be different from one field to the next. It'll be different from one town to the next. Um, but I think if we want to engage people with their local surroundings, I'm not sure that these targets are helpful. Thanks, Borg. You've reminded me of a book that 
you both may have read Last Child in the Woods by a man called Robert Louvre, who talks about the lost generations of children in particular who no longer run wild and, and discover and build dams and climb trees and so on. And I think many people have, have commented on how that has to a certain extent changed in the last lockdown months. That I've certainly met more, more kids in the woods locally here than I ever did before. So that's perhaps another uh, note of hope um, on which we might begin to wrap up this evening's discussion. Um, but Paddy, sorry, back to you, because I didn't ask you the, the same question and I've forgotten what the question uh, was, but did you want to come in on the... Half Earth. I, I agree. Yeah. I, I had the extraordinary privilege of spending a, a week living next door to E.O. Wilson in Mozambique in a national park. And he's a fascinating man, um, but and I have to be very careful as my own years advance. He has a very advanced years these days. And I think a very unfortunate thing can happen with very prestigious Harvard scientists. And that is that there comes a point where whatever they write gets published. <laughs> and I really think, and also there's a, my fear is, is that, you know, America, the, the declining imperial power of our e epoch, that imperial mentality is still very much there. What, you know, what on earth are you going to say to Africans? You've got to give half of Africa to, to wildlife. I mean, th th there's something there that smacks of a very dangerous uh, arrogance towards other people. Um, you know, if you, if you live comfortably in New England to say this, it just, it, it just yeah, I mean, I, I think we've got to be very careful about all targets, as Boric says. I think we need them, mm. but they've got to be clearly thought out. And I think this one was a real waste of space, quite honestly. Thanks. I'm going to begin to pull this all together and ask you to sort of construct something to send us off to bed or f to um, a glass of wine on, a, on a, an optimistic note, because I think that this evening has been an optimistic discussion. There has been much um, a sense that there's less conflict, that there's a sense of pushing as an open door in many ways in the themes that have come up this evening and that there's a readiness for change, but there's certainly a demand for uh, a top-down as well as a bottom-up approach, because we've talked a lot about how we can do things at a local level, but we've, we've also talked about the need uh, in Ireland to see the, the good things in the programme for government actually funded and resourced and enacted. Um, but um, as we pull this together, it, it seems to me, um, Paddy and Pori, that the, there is really very little between your two different positions. You're both arguing for a restorative approach, approach to nature with perhaps some minor details um, that, that separate you. But can I ask you, can I thank you both for, uh, for your contributions this evening? And you've stimulated a lot of interest and um, clearly the questions are still coming in that we're going to have to wrap things up. We hope that this um, recording will be available for people who didn't manage to tune in and that there were some hiccups, I think, in getting through the, the Zoom and the Eventbrite uh, hurdles. But um, I, I'm, I'm very grateful to you both. And I'm hoping, Paddy, that you'll come back and see us again in Feathered to uh, continue the good work you've, you've started. It. Yeah, the, the, we didn't even get into flood control and the OPW. Uh, but your your Irish Times article stimulated a lot of uh, of good discussion and uh, enlightenment. And uh, Porig, thank you also very much indeed for being with us this evening. And hope that we can do something like this again soon. Um, for those of you who are attending the the Apple Fest program, uh, do go on and see all the other excellent um, events that are taking place. And uh, they're obviously all online, but there are some great things to enjoy, including music and discussions for the remainder of the program. So on that note, I'm going to wind things down and thank you again both very much for this evening. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Mm -hmm.